Are you ready to make the most of your oil and gas mineral rights? Welcome to the Mineral Rights Podcast. Get the knowledge and resources you need to manage your minerals and royalties. Here is your host, Matt Sands. Hello and welcome to the Mineral Rights Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Sands, and I'm joined by my co-host, Justin Williams, and we're here to help you make the most of your minerals and royalties. And today we're going to go through listener questions for February 2024. Uh, Justin, we had a bunch of questions that have been sitting in my inbox uh, for this past several months. So I wanted to make sure that we get caught up and we have a few more to go, but we're making some progress towards getting answers to your questions. And again, if you have a question you'd like us to answer on the show, just send me an email to feedback at mineralrightspodcast.com. With that, Justin, you want to go ahead and dive into this first question here? Let's do it. We got some really interesting questions. And our first one here is about um, helium. So the question is, do service estate owners receive any type of royalties from a producing helium well? Producers are going to start seismic testing for helium in April on my land in Northeast Arizona. The railroad had the mineral rights, but they sold them to the Navajo tribe and someone else. I don't have any mineral rights. If they find helium on my property, they say they can just move in and drill. Do I have rights and do I receive compensation? And so, Matt, this is an interesting question, and we talk about surface use agreements in episode 23, specifically how to negotiate a surface use agreement. And Matt, it sounds like that would be the case for him, where if he doesn't own any minerals, really the surface use would be what he might be compensated for if he owns the surface. Yeah, that's exactly right. I think that, and certainly, Dave, don't consider this legal advice. We're just providing this for uh, informational purposes, so definitely get with an attorney. Uh, to get help specific to your situation. But in general, the production of any minerals, the benefit of that would fall to the mineral estate. So in this case, the Navajo tribe and whoever else owns the minerals. If you just own the surface rights, you would be owed compensation for damages to your property. So there is a doctrine called the accommodation doctrine, but they can't just come in and like push you out of the way and say, no, we're going to use this to build a well pad and drill a well they have to make a reasonable accommodation for your use of the surface land. And so that usually results in a surface use agreement. So there's something in writing between the surface owner and the oil and gas company that states what your rights and responsibilities are and what theirs are. And so that's definitely something you'd want to have an attorney help you negotiate. And usually it's a fixed like rental payment or you get damages for the amount of acres that they disturb, that kind of a thing. Sometimes you can actually negotiate an overriding royalty. So basically, even though you don't own the mineral rights, you could get what is out of the leasehold side of things. So basically their side of that revenue from the oil and gas that's sold, or in this case, the helium that's sold. So that's all something that you should ask your attorney and see if you could potentially negotiate an overriding royalty. So if they are successful and do produce helium, then you could get a percentage of that. The other thing to think about is what you use the land for and how that land is going to get restored back to its original condition when they're done and when they plug that well and and reclaim the land. So make sure that in that surface use agreement, you're very clear about how you want that land left. Otherwise, you know they're going to leave it probably in the easiest way possible for them, which is maybe not the best situation for you. So definitely think about that as well. I will say the other side of things is it could be that maybe they're doing seismic testing to look at a place to store helium that's produced nearby. So that could be the other side of the equation that you would need to be mindful of. And if that is the case, if they're looking at storing the helium in the pore space, then it's a potential that you own the pore space and you could receive revenue from that. So that's kind of an interesting nuance with pore space ownership usually belongs to the surface owner. I'm not sure off the top of my head with Arizona, how that is split, but again, an attorney can help you advise on that, but it could be another opportunity if they're looking to store helium on your land. And, uh, you know, again, you could negotiate an agreement to, to get paid for that as well. Absolutely, Matt. And, you know, the public records could be your best friend. I, you know, I would certainly go into the county records and see if you can find information about your tract of land and if there have been leases signed and just different information that may be available to you might answer some questions, and kind of help you get started with the conversation with that attorney. Yeah, that's a great tip. So yeah, let's talk about this next question here from Bill. He says, my wells are producing at the end of my primary five-year term. 
I was wondering, since my lease is extended, is it common to not get the reward money on the extension? According to my lease, the lessee will pay the lessor an amount equal to the initial consideration given for the execution. According to owner relations, no lease will give a reward if the wells are producing. Royalties will continue, though. Thanks in advance. So, Justin, you want to take a shot at this one? Yeah, absolutely, Matt. And, you know, this is a really common question. And for new mineral right owners, and if it's producing, typically that lease bonus that's paid is for the time period when they are going in and exploring and getting a well drilled. Matt, it's not uncommon and typically how it goes that once that well is producing, that lease is going to be held by production as long as that well is producing. So, Bill, if you're receiving those royalties, it sounds like in this situation, without knowing more, they're correct. You would continue to receive those royalties, but because the lease is held by production, you wouldn't be looking at another lease bonus. Yeah, that's exactly right. I think that those um, options to extend the lease basically is if it takes them longer than that five-year primary term in your case, Bill, and if they were still doing the exploration or they are getting permits and getting ready to drill and they hadn't drilled yet and it was coming up on year five, then that would be when they would have approached you to extend the lease. But it sounds like they drilled a well within that primary term. And now your lease is in the secondary term, like Justin said, and it'll be held by production until that stops producing and that well gets plugged. You know, in which case then you could negotiate a new lease. So that, I guess, a good problem to have that you're getting royalties. So congratulations on that. And if you want to learn more about oil and gas leasing for anyone else that's in that situation of trying to negotiate a lease, we covered that in episode six. So we'll link to that in the show notes. Absolutely, Matt. And we'd be remiss without mentioning that royalty rate. The royalty rate is so very important in your lease just for this reason. Once you receive that bonus, you drill a well, you really want a, a good royalty rate. And even if that maybe means a little bit less of a bonus, because those are the royalties that could be continuing for years and years. All right, Matt. So our next one here is from Monica. And Monica has a question about dormant mineral interests. So it sounds like her father-in-law passed away in 1999 in North Dakota. And his mother had mineral interest in Valley County, Montana. So she was asking some questions around, does Montana have a dormant mineral statue? And she was thinking that there was a 20-year thing going on with Montana. And Matt, you did some really great research into this. And it sounds like Montana does not have a dormant mineral statue, though North Dakota does. That's correct. So Monica, the good news is that mineral ownership doesn't lapse in Montana. And so there hasn't been dormant mineral legislation passed, although other states do have it in place. And North Dakota is one where you may need to file an affidavit or make a claim every, I think it's every 10 years in North Dakota, but don't quote me on that. Definitely get help from an attorney if you have some interest in North Dakota that are potentially going to be considered dormant because you don't want those to revert back to the surface owner. You want to protect your um, claim to those severed mineral interests. And this is really only an, an issue if you have severed mineral rights. In other words, you own just the mineral rights under the ground. You don't own the surface rights. If you owned both the surface and the minerals, and it's less of an issue. There's really nothing that they can do in that situation. But yeah, if you have severed mineral rights, some states have passed dormant mineral statutes, and we'll link to that in the show notes. We covered a, an episode on that. Matt, that was episode 66 that we covered dormant okay. mineral statutes. Great. So yeah, episode 66. And so that's definitely one to go and listen if you are wondering if you might own minerals in a state that has a dormant mineral statute, because that's an important thing to to worry about. Now, if they can't locate you, so that's the other side of the question is, okay, so my state doesn't have a dormant mineral statute, but what happens to minerals who the owners can't be located? So for example, maybe the interest didn't go through probate. They're still sitting in father-in-law's name you know, for the past 25 years, operator goes and drills a well. They can't locate your father-in-law, obviously, because he's passed away. And so then what they do is they escheat that over to the state, any unclaimed royalties. So basically, if they can't locate the mineral owner, they'll go to the district court in the county where the minerals are located to establish a trust account. And usually it goes over to the state. And whether it's the comptroller, or Department of Revenue, depending on the state, there's different departments that will um, administer that. But basically, it's held in perpetuity in your name until those heirs can be located. So it's not uncommon if you've inherited mineral rights to have some unclaimed royalties out there. So definitely be sure to do a search in your predecessor's names in the states that they lived, as well as where the, the states where the 
mineral interests are located to see if there are any funds that were handed over to the estate. And in order to claim them, you typically need to provide estate documentation that's like a death certificate, copy of a will, probate documents that show you're the rightful heir, and then you can go ahead and claim those. So it's kind of a cumbersome process, but it definitely is worth taking a look at because there can be sometimes significant money that's out there. I'm just waiting for you to go find it. And we'll link to the episode where we covered how to find missing money as well, because that's definitely something that you can do. And it's just go to uh, missingmoney.com and uh, yeah, do a search there for any names that you know of, you know, relatives that had owned these interests over time. And that's also in episode 103 that we covered that in more detail. Absolutely, Matt. Yeah. And that's something that we've talked about before on different episodes that, you know, you really should do that regularly. Even if you're a mineral owner and you have those minerals in your name, it never hurts to go kind of take a look at unclaimed funds to see if there might be other properties out there that you don't know about. All right, Matt. Sorry. Next one here is from Mary. Uh, Mary says, I have a property description question. Our inherited mineral rights in Texas are described in meets and bounds, but we continue to receive leases referring to abstracts or units. How can we convert meets and bounds to the new property descriptions? And Matt, for those that don't know, meets and bounds was the standard way of measuring property for many, many years or marking property. Um, And nowadays we have a better system of using abstracts and different surveys to locate tracks Yeah, that's a great point. And certainly it's something that we deal with in Texas and in the 13 original colonies. So if you want to learn more about how legal descriptions work, how property is described and how that relates to your mineral rights, I go over that in a lot more detail in my mineral basics course. You can find that at mineralrightspodcast.com forward slash courses. But basically, Mary, and she's referring to property that she owns in Harrison County, Texas. And I just wrapped up a project for a client in Harrison County. And Mary, it'll make your head hurt. I, I do this every day. And sometimes in certain parts of Texas, especially East Texas, where each of those surveys is a very irregular shape. So basically when they surveyed the land, it's like kind of how the original Spanish um, land grants went. And so you'll have all these very irregular surveys, they call them, or abstract. And basically it's a survey abstract, or in other words, the area that they surveyed and they put a unique label on it based on that, an individual's name. And so then you'll look for the Smith survey, perhaps it'll be like A-23 or whatever it is. And within that survey itself, there might be distinct tracts of land that were subdivided over time. And so that meets and bounds description will typically start at the corner of one of those surveys and will go a certain direction and a certain distance and then go a different angle and a certain direction and a certain distance and then kind of trace out the outline of that track within the survey. So even though your mineral rights might be described in meets and bounds and may refer back to the original deed that granted those interests or maybe when that land was subdivided, you will have an interest in a unit, in other words, in an area that might be pooling together multiple tracks of land within a given survey to form a gas unit in this case. And your tract might be, say, 50 acres out of the 640-acre gas unit. And that 50 acres is described by the meets and bounds. But at the same time, your division order will refer to a abstract. And so it'll be the higher level, the bigger picture division of the land, whereas your actual tract might be a small portion of that. So In terms of how to calculate or how to visualize the meets and bounds description, it's within that survey that you have an interest in, and you'd have to go and just trace out the outline of that track. I will link in the show notes to a free tool that you can use to enter in your meets and bounds description in order to convert that into like a visual representation of where the shape of your property then you can see sort of where that would fit in the actual survey itself. Unfortunately, Mary, there's no real quick and easy answer, a real easy conversion from meets and bounds to a new property description, so to speak. It is what it is, and it's just a kind of cumbersome thing. But once you get that visual representation, you can overlay it onto the survey. Another tip that I find is helpful is if you know the gross acreage of your tract, if you look at the plat for that gas unit, you should see on that plat, they'll have each of the tracts of land drawn. And if you can find your tract of land, given the acreage, 
especially if it's 77 acres or something sort of unique and there's no other 77 acre tracks, you can sort of see it on there and, and sort of that could be a really easy shortcut. That's the only way that I know how to really get an easy visual representation or how to link it to the actual survey itself. Sometimes you have to look at the plat for the gas unit. So good luck, Mary. Hope it helps. So Justin, you want to go ahead and read the next one here? Totally. Yeah. I thought this next question from Katie was a really interesting one. So I listened to episode 213 this morning. And I was really excited to hear about the Well Done Foundation. I work in disaster relief nonprofit on the fundraising side, but I've long dreamed of combining my passion for mineral rights and nonprofit work. Do you know of any other nonprofit, non-governmental organizations that work in the mining space? I intend on reaching out to Ev to see if they have any uh, need for volunteer work in her specialty, but I forget it was worth asking. And Matt, this is a really great question. You know, the Well Done Foundation is is really a great organization that helps with orphaned wells. And Matt, do you want to talk a little bit about them and and maybe anybody else that you know about in that space? Absolutely. So thanks for your email, Katie. And she mentions a book called Uranium by Tom Zollner. And so we'll link to that in the show notes. So she mentions that's an excellent read. And it's certainly something that's going to be, I think, really important as we look at maybe growing the nuclear power generation capability. But, you know, in terms of the Well Done Foundation, Katie, you know, I would reach reach out to Curtis Shuck, who's the executive director and the founder of that, and just to see what kind of help. I'm sure they are always looking for volunteers, so I'm sure they could find a fit for you. And hopefully you've been able to reach out to him and make that connection. Curtis came and spoke at the National Association of Royalty Owners Convention in New Orleans last October and gave a really interesting talk about all the things that they're doing to plug and abandon orphan wells. So this is a really big problem across the country. And certainly we've seen it in the headlines. We've reported on it here on the show where you have these wells that were drilled, you know, hundred years ago in some cases, and they were they were abandoned with the technology that was available at the time, but it maybe was not the latest and most robust technology to where they can be leaking methane, they can be leaking water, you know, basically if they're injecting water into saltwater disposal wells into certain formations that these wells are tied to, then water can come up to the surface through these old well bores. And then in some cases, they're from companies that went bankrupt and they never plugged the well. So the old surface equipment is still sitting there, the farmer or the rancher, the surface owner is dealing with this eyesore, this environmental issue. So Well Done Foundation goes out and where people will write in and say, hey, I've got an orphan well on my um, property. Can you come and plug it? And they'll just kind of prioritize and go through and they re- do fundraising and it's nonprofit. So you know, if you're looking at helping to you know, reduce the number of orphan wells, it's a great organization to uh, donate to. And so I've reached out to Curtis to have him on the show. So hopefully we can get him on the show sometime to talk about what they're doing there as well. But yeah, good luck, uh, Katie. And as far as other organizations or nonprofits in the mining space, I'm not aware of any off the top of my head, although there may be some on the mining side, not just the oil and gas orphan well side of things. I did a little bit of research before and didn't find anything, but I would just keep looking and maybe there is something else out there. But hopefully you're able to connect with the Well Done Foundation and they can utilize your your talents. So, So appreciate your help, Katie. Absolutely. Kudos to you, Katie, for wanting to do something, some volunteer work in a wonderful space. Matt, our next question here is from Kelly. Kelly asks, what is the difference between recoupment and prior period adjustments? And she's referring to um, royalty payments and adjustments to those royalty payments on her checks. And Matt, um, first, we should say we're not accountants, we're not attorneys, but this is a common thing that can happen where the operator withholds future royalty payments for an overpayment. And so basically they're withholding that money to, to get that overpayment satisfied. And it's effectively like putting your interest in a suspense while the negative balance is paid back. Um, and Matt, I've seen this on my own checks where uh, maybe they take a percentage of it each month to pay back whatever, or if it's a small amount, um, they'll just do a prior period adjustment. You'll see this negative amount for whatever the overpayment was in the next check. Um, Matt, there's scenarios where it could be a large amount. And then like we mentioned, it might get put in suspense. But this is also something that typically, in my experience, on the division orders, you see a statement about how they're going to handle overpayments. And so that's something that you can kind of look at and work with the operator on, on how you want those handled before you execute that division order. Yeah, that's exactly right. I think you've explained it well. 
Only thing I can add is really that the recoupment concept is if they are recouping an overpayment to you for royalties that you were not uh, supposed to be paid. So for example, you had a certain decimal interest in a well, some additional information came up that identified that you had a smaller interest than they thought originally. And so in order to make everybody whole, they have to stop paying you those royalties and they have to wait until the other owner is kind of caught up and both of you are whole. And then in which case they'll continue to pay you the new decimal interest you have in those wells. And so that can be one situation where a recoupment could occur. Now, prior period adjustments is more so related to, and it can be related to changes in decimal interest, but it's usually you know, adjustments to prices or volumes. So for example, when they sell gas to the gas plant, they'll do the final accounting. And sometimes that comes in after they have to pay the royalty owners for their gas production. And so there'll be some small adjustments to the actual prices that they were paid for the gas and for the plant products. And then also the volumes will be slightly adjusted. And so that's very common to see those small adjustments. It'll be just a very small difference in price or it'd be a small difference in the volumes. And those those corrections show up as a PPA or a prior period adjustment. So again, just to recap this, recoupment is the ability for the operator to withhold future payments until a debt or an overpayment is satisfied. And one of the mechanisms that they can use to identify and to correct any small overpayments can be prior period adjustments. So they're definitely related, but again, slightly different uses. Usually the recoupment is when there's been a major difference, you know, an overpayment of significant amount that they need to stop paying basically until those future payments are recouped out of future royalties that they'll just pay off that debt, so to speak, until it's a zero balance and then they'll start paying you uh, royalties again. Absolutely, Matt. And this is a good lesson as to why you should watch your check stubs. Absolutely. Definitely. All right, Matt. Our next question here, Matt, from David. Uh, He says, I just found your podcast a week or two ago. I'm looking forward to listening to more episodes. So far, I've listened to a couple and I've enjoyed them. One of the podcast episodes I listened to was number three on how to calculate NRI, and it generated some questions. And so, Matt, I'm going to take these one by one for you and let you answer because this is way into the weeds on this, and uh, you're the man for the answer. So David says here, um, You've shared that to get the net mineral acres, you take the interest from the deed and multiply it by the acres of the tract from the deed. This number is then used in combination with the drilling spacing unit and the royalty rate. And David says, I've seen situations where a lease is leasing something different than what the deed states, less acreage. And in this instance, I gather you'd recalculate the net mineral acres based on the leased acreage rather than the deed acreage. Is this correct? So that's a good question, David. And it just depends on the situation. Let's say you own minerals or portion of the minerals in an entire section. Maybe they're going to drill a vertical well that's only going to be covering 80 acres. And so only uh, a portion of the overall mineral acres that you own is being leased. And so the leased acreage might have the legal description of just the 80 acres or maybe one half of a quarter section. And the rest of your acreage would be unleased at that point. So Whatever the lease describes is exactly the acreage that is being leased. And so if that means you have a deed that shows more than the lease, that means you own mineral interest in more than what that lease covers. And so there could be additional leases that you would sign for that unleased acreage if they ever you know, decide to come in and drill additional wells. So that is how you would figure it out. Now, if in terms of figuring out your net mineral acres on the entire section, for example, you would have to basically go into whatever the, the gross acreage in, on your deed and then multiply that by the undivided fractional interest that you own. So yeah, hopefully that makes sense in terms of the difference between the lease acreage and the deed acreage. Absolutely, Matt. And I'm going to kind of skip around in his list here so we can group these together. Another question David had is, in reviewing his grandfather's deeds, he said he often sees what I consider random interest, but wondering if there's some higher logic to it that he's missing. Uh, For example, he randomly pulled up four deeds for the purposes of the email, and the mineral interest conveyed were 524, 596, 132nd, and 11, 256. And Matt, this is very common to see in deeds. Um, And I think it confuses a lot of people because it's just kind of a weird fraction and nobody understands where did this come from. 
yeah, who knows where these came from. It could be that it was how it was subdivided over time. Well, there was one owner at one point in time, but then maybe they passed it down to kids or grandkids. It depends on how many family members, or maybe they had a certain debt that they had to pay. And the value of those interests at the time, they were coming up with a fraction that would equal the value of the debt that they were having to repay. So I've seen that where maybe an attorney did some work for somebody and in exchange for that work, they received you know, a fraction of the mineral interest as payment. So it's hard to say without understanding the history, David, as to what transpired. Sometimes if you trace the, the deeds back, it'll become clear sort of how that maybe was split up or maybe who knows, you'll never know because there was some side agreement that, as to how they came up with that fraction. But in any case, if you do know that, that is kind of like a cheat code in determining your net interest. And again, of course, it depends on a lot of other things and what the original owner had and making sure that they were actually conveying what they owned. Because I've seen situations where somebody purported to, for example, in this case here, if it was 524, you know, that that fraction 524 is close to about 20%. Well, if they only owned, you know, say 15% of the minerals instead of 524s, then they were over conveying. And so you would, even though the deed says that you should have gotten 524s, they can only give so much as they had. So they would have given you the the 15% of that instead of the the 20.83%, which is what 524s is. So, I mean, that's a little bit about that situation. Now, I, I will say, and using that example that you gave and how do you actually use that? So for example, let's say on the deed that said that your grandfather was given 524 undivided interest in the minerals in a quarter section of land, the gross acreage, in this case, let's say it was the Northwest quarter. If it's a 640 acre section, 640 divided by four is 160 acres. So that's the gross acreage that you would see described on the deed on a lease and all of those things. Well, you don't own 160 net acres. In this case, if you had 524s, you would figure out your net acreage by multiplying the 160 gross acres times five divided by 24, and that would equal 33.33 net mineral acres. And so you have to use those fractions to figure out how many net acres you own and that'll determine ultimately how much you should get paid if a well gets drilled there. Because like David said in episode three, we walk through how to calculate your net revenue interest in a well. And it requires that you know your net acreage. You have to know the number of acres in the drilling spacing unit for the well or wells that, are, that you're calculating it for. Then you have to know your lease royalty rate. And we walk through step by step in that episode on how to calculate your net revenue interest or your decimal interest is what that's also called in those wells so that you can make sure you're getting paid correctly. Absolutely, Matt. And you know, it's a complicated process, but really taking it step by step is the key. Each piece of information links to the other one and you just got to take it step by step and work through finding the proper information to figure these. It becomes far less intimidating the more you do it, Matt. Uh, but I know when I first started out, it was like, my God, this is a, a horror show from math class. So the next question, Matt, that kind of links to what you were mentioning about a loan. So David mentions, I've seen situations where my grandfather purchases a mineral interest then sells it back to the owner, and then it comes back to him. It seems bizarre to me, but I'm wondering if there's a reason that this sequence of transactions would be performed. I could probably find some examples of this to send, but I thought it'd be easier just to ask a broader question. And Matt, that could be loans. I've seen other deeds where it read so that if the original owner ever desired to have that back from the person they sold it to, that they had a certain amount of time and uh, price that they would buy it at. It, it, it's amazing all the different flavors that come through. With this. Yeah, exactly. It's it could be collateral for a loan. You know that real property had value, and so they were exchanging value more than likely. There and, and technically, you do have to provide some consideration in a real estate transaction in order for it to be valid. So that would be the presumption. You know, who knows what the the arrangement was? Again, there could be another side arrangement that was in place between your grandfather and the individual they kept on buying and selling the interest to. You know, it could be that who knows what kind of shenanigans can happen. You know, if, if somebody says, Well, I want to hide this asset, I'm getting divorced, I'm gonna sell it to you, but then we have this side agreement that says you're just gonna sell it right back to me at some point because 
I just want to make sure my wife doesn't get it. You know, so there, there can be some, some crazy things that happen in terms of how these things get handled, but more, I would expect it's probably a pretty plain vanilla type situation. It's probably collateral for a loan. The loan was paid back or whatever. And then they, you know, he got the, the minerals back, but yeah, it's always kind of fun to trace these deeds back and kind of see all the different permutations of how they've been handed down over time. Talking about this particular situation, and you mentioned the fractions here. Again, the 524 is a, is a pretty good fraction, but I know this was your grandfather and maybe your your dad and his siblings own a fraction of it. And then if you get it and your siblings get it, then it keeps getting subdivided and getting smaller and smaller. So I think it's worth mentioning if you're in the situation where you've inherited these interests and they're are situations where you're looking at potentially having them between siblings. And I've talked to a few clients recently where they're thinking about recombining all of these interests into a single entity. So whether that's a trust or a family LLC, that can be a great way to preserve the value of these interests. Because to be frank, over time, as these get subdivided even smaller and smaller, then it becomes not even worth the expense to go through probate to get them in your name. And especially you know, when you're thinking it's going to cost $4,000 to go through probate, whether you have a property that's worth a million dollars or worth a thousand dollars. And so you're like, why would I spend $4,000 to get a, a piece of property that's worth 1,000? The ROI is not there. So in that case, it's, you know, almost makes sense to just give them up, let them go to a tax sale or something like that. And so that's why I think it's worth mentioning if you're in the situation where you're managing these assets, they're just in, handed down to individuals over time, consider recombining them and working with family members, whether that's you buy out some of the other family members to recombine those, you know, put them in a trust, put them in an LLC. So then you don't have to go through the expense of probate and you can kind of keep them whole. It gives you more bargaining power when you go to negotiate a lease and all the things. So Definitely get help from an attorney if you're in that kind of situation and you're thinking about that, but it's definitely worth talking about with your family. Absolutely, man. And David, you're asking some really great questions when it comes to figuring this all out and kind of tracing it. And, um, you know, something that, that I definitely got caught up in early on in this journey was when you're, there's the oral history from a family, which um, it's always interesting to see what your predecessors did. What were they doing? How were they doing it? But when you're doing the research, it's really just a matter of fact. It's not uncommon for the family to think that one thing was done and then did come find out later that the documents say that what actually happened was just slightly different. So be sure that you kind of keep focused on following the trail of the documents and running title and don't get too caught up in what you thought may have happened versus what the documents say happened. Because at the end of the day, the operators, everybody else, it's really just going to matter what the documents say. And Matt, on that note, he had another question here that was not NRI related. And he mentions that I have a lot of situations where the lease is taken by a broker or landman. And in these instances, how do I find the company that the minerals were leased to? But in his case, he's really trying to figure out what happened with these things and kind of follow the trail, Matt. And, you know, that's not uncommon at all. I've had the experience of a broker coming to me, um, looking to sign a lease for another operator. And then typically during that transaction, they will tell you who it is. But if you weren't party to that transaction then it may be a little bit more difficult. You may have to go searching to figure out who actually took that lease and is operating it or is participating with the operator who drilled the well. Yeah, that's exactly right. And it all boils down to the legal description. Unfortunately, David, that's the only way to go back. He mentioned that his dad has a lot of information and he says, I suppose I can try to link a division order to a lease based on the date and legal description, but this seems a bit haphazard to me. And it really, unfortunately, That's the only way to do it because the legal description is the address of those minerals on the surface of the earth. And that's the way that you can determine what wells are within that legal description. And again, what your decimal interest would be based on that division order. And operators will change over time. That's very common that you would have either a broker lease the minerals and then sell it to the operator. So even the name on the original lease, even though that well was drilled right during that time period, that operator that ultimately drilled the well and operated it was probably different than the name of the, of the lessee. And you would just have to go back and look at the, the division order, the legal description for that well, and then go to the State Oil and Gas Commission website to locate that legal description and locate that well and figure out, is it still active? Is it still producing? Is it not? and all those things. And so that's really the the only way to do it. And again, this is something I go into how to do 
in my mineral management basics course, piecing together the legal description with how to find it on your state oil and gas commission website to figure out what kind of current oil and gas activity is going on. So in other words, if you inherited these and you're trying to figure out, are they producing wells that you should be getting paid royalties? That's important step to figure out. And then also what's the potential for future um, drilling to occur? And that's all something you can find on that state oil and gas commission website. Absolutely, man. And something I've mentioned before is, you know, this is getting into this information. It's a lot to take in. And if you're new to it, it's a lot of information to learn. Um, but just keep moving forward. As you continue to move forward and the more that you do, you understand more about the last things that you did and you just get better and better at linking this all together. But man, it can certainly make your head spin if you're new to this and, and taking this all in. It really can. And there's, there's lots of resources out there. Again, if you want to take my course, there's a lot of good information. Also, becoming a member of NARO is a great way to go. Justin and I are both members and, and volunteer on the on various state and national boards and has a lot of information available to members in terms of webinars and events and in-person conventions and things like that. So you can learn about all this stuff. There's a lot of other people that are in your shoes. You can share war stories with folks. You can meet them and, and you know build friendships and stuff like that. So it's a great organization to be a member of as well. So that wraps up our listener questions for February of 2024. And we'll just keep working through them, Matt. Keep working through. Keep sending your questions to feedback at mineralrightspodcast.com and we will get you an answer and hopefully read it on an upcoming episode. So thanks again for listening. Thanks, Justin. Thanks so much for listening to the Mineral Rights Podcast with your host, Matt Sands. Don't forget to subscribe and share at mineralrightspodcast.com. The Mineral Rights Podcast should not be construed as investment, legal, or tax advice. All information is believed to be from reliable sources. However, we make no representation as to its completeness or accuracy.